Uh, let me also just say thank you to all uh, of you who came out on this, the, certainly the coldest night of the season so far. Uh, a, a brave thing to do to, to hear a talk. And then finally, thanks to both the Lowell Institute and to the Charles River Museum of Industry and Innovation for having the talk in just this, this stunning place. Uh, it's my first visit here. and. Uh, uh, and an immense thrill to be on the site of uh, such an important transformation in the history of the city of Boston uh, and the larger world that it helped to build. So, what are we going to talk about tonight? Uh, we are going to talk about chapter nine. That is, uh, the uh, title of my talk tonight is taken from the title of the chapter of this substantial book. Uh, and then I will take you through a, a story that surrounds, if you will, or provides context for the story that this museum tells brilliantly. That is the, the rise of the cotton textile mills here in New England, the, the industry, the economy around those issues. What I, I mean to suggest by my title and what this book, shall I hold it up for you again, uh, is, is about in many ways, is a story of political economy. Um, those two words were pulled apart in the 19th century. In many ways, I won't go into this story now, but in many ways as a result of the kind of developments that took place here. But in the time period that we're talking about, they were routinely and always used together. When Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, what he expressly said he was writing about was political economy. And so that's what uh, this book, have, have I mentioned the book before? It is about a uh, marvelous Christmas gift for children of all ages. Um, this book attempts to tell Boston's story from the time of its founding, even before its founding, uh, through the era of the Civil War. And it focuses on exactly that relationship between the building of a polity, a state, a, a political entity, and the way that Bostonians learn and innovate and develop ways of mustering the resources that they have at their command to generate the wealth, the revenue, the materials necessary to create the kind of polity they want, the kind, a kind of polity that will support their aspirations of course, its founders were Puritan for a kind of religious culture, but also the kind of polity that would sustain its ability to be an autonomous, if not independent, political culture. And so the arc of the book as a whole traces in three major sections how I see that story developing. The first third of the book is about the earliest colonial period, the 1600s. It starts with Boston's founding by English Puritans and takes the story through the end of that first century. And in that first part, the essential point that the chapters trace is the way in which starting out from this quite small spot on the Shawmut Peninsula in Massachusetts Bay, a really in, in many ways ill-chosen spot for starting a, a powerful city, the combination of the colonists, uh, the thousands of them who came over from England, and their leaders, in particular their political leaders and the merchants who became important figures in the city's early history, worked out a way to achieve those goals that I've talked about that itself was quite surprising. So for me to be able to tell you the story today of the way in which what happened here with the rise of the textile mills transformed Boston as a political and an economic entity, we have to know what the before was, right? So I'm briefly going to describe how I see that. So by the time Boston was founded in 1630, there were lots of other European colonies in the Americas, Spanish, Portuguese, Dutch, French, etc., other earlier English colonies. And the great majority of those, and the ones that had managed to prosper in one way or another, I kind of put that in air quotes because it was not a prosperity that many of us would have enjoyed, um, but the way in which those tended to prosper was in a kind of classic colonial sense in that 
These were places that produced commodities, usually of high value, and I'll say more about that in a second. And their function in the larger system was to send those commodities back home to the home country, whether that was Spain or France or England or whatever. And in return, the home country would supply them with the things that they needed that were manufactured goods, etc., to get along. A very dependent relationship. In, in Virginia, for instance, tobacco was the commodity they raised for that. In Spanish America, the silver and gold that were found in the mines of those regions uh, were, were central to that. And the reason that commodities of high value were so important to this is something that everyone ought to know about really world history before the invention of the steamboat or uh, other kinds of mechanized powered forms of transit. That is, we're talking mostly about the age of sailing ships here. And the universal problem in faraway colonies in the age of sailing ships was how expensive it was to ship goods far away. And that's why the colonial projects went looking for goods of very high value back in the home country, things that were either rare or unheard of there, like tobacco or sugar, or things that were already intrinsically valued, like silver and gold, right? Because if you were paying for a crew and the expensive technology of a ship and having to pay them for the months that it took to get you from America to Europe, say, you couldn't send cheap stuff. Right? And you couldn't send perishable stuff, right? Because in either case, by the time it got to the home port, no one would want that. And the problem with colonial New England was that try as they might, and the early chapters talk about the search for gold and silver and the attempts to find it and uh, ideas about raising other kind of high value crops. The problem is there wasn't anything. That is, the New England economy was perfectly fine producing ordinary stuff that you could live a happy life on. Corn and wheat and vegetables of all sorts and you could raise your livestock. And, but there was no market for any of that stuff back home in London. What essentially saves the day or makes Boston and the surrounding countryside viable as an economic venture is not something that actually happens in New England. It's the simultaneous rise in places like Barbados, and then Jamaica, and Antigua, and other British West Indian islands, of an explosion in the sugar industry, right? At, in the 1640s, Barbados starts importing enslaved Africans by the thousands because they've learned this technology from the Dutch and others and can with it produce large quantities of sugar that was a very valuable crop back in London and in the rest of Europe. In such demand that on these small Caribbean islands the plantation owners quickly began to use every square inch of arable land they could find to grow sugar. They didn't want to waste this land on corn and wheat and livestock and the like. And this is what made New England, because its merchants, starting in the 1640s, realized that even if you couldn't sell corn and wheat and barrel staves and shingles and uh, all kinds of other things that you could produce in New England in London, or Paris or Spain or whatever, you could sell it in Jamaica. You could sell it in Barbados. And there was a huge demand for it there. And so by the 1640s, 1650s, the structure of New England's economy for the next 150 years is already in place. That is, what was now possible was that the thousands of English farmers spreading across the countryside could produce this stuff. The merchants would buy it from them, ship it to Barbados, Jamaica, etc., and of course soon to competitor empires, islands like Cuba and uh, San Domingue and that sort of thing. Uh, and there sell it for valuable stuff that then they could bring to Europe, to England, etc., and with that buy the things that they could bring back to New England, to Boston. And so what was called the triangle trade, although it's really multilateral, begins there, and Boston's economic place in the whole Atlantic world is, is pretty much set then. And it remains the basis of Boston's economy through the 17th century, 
during which the colonization of the region spreads out widely, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, Maine, etc., with Boston retaining a kind of economic hegemony over the region. In the 18th century, in the century leading up to the revolution, it continues to expand. Much of the effort uh, is to then deal with some of the problems and the questions that this international economy and Boston's participation in it creates. But the only part that I want to leave you with from those first two uh, sections of the book here is this, that what remained a major concern, but also in some ways a hidden one, was what I'll call here the problem of slavery. That is, as I've described it to you, Boston is a city and the economy that it builds in New England that's heavily dependent on the institution of slavery. But for the most part, the great majority of the enslaved people producing the goods that they depend on don't live in Boston and New England. They live far across the sea. And they're relatively easy to ignore or not attend to if you don't want to think too much about this sort of thing. And finally, they live in places like Jamaica, Barbados, Antigua, St. Kitts, Nevis, etc., etc., places that have no political authority over Boston and New England. Right? The Jamaican Assembly, their representative, not representatives, their lobbyists in Parliament, you know, they're trying to do what they can for their own economy and society, just as New Englanders are, but in no way does Jamaica decide how Boston and New England govern themselves, right? And that's part of what makes it relatively easy for New Englanders to imagine this as a kind of far away and distant problem. The story of the third part of the book, which I'm now going to zero in on because that's where the, the rise of the Lowell textile mills comes in, is in many ways the story of a political economy transformation. The economy part here we are in this building, you can already begin to guess at, and I'll, I'll say some more about that in a minute. But the political part has everything to do with the fact that in 1787, 8, 9, Boston and New England participate in the drafting and then ratification of a constitution for the new 13 independent states of the United States. And in doing so, they unwittingly annex themselves to a government that will eventually be in the hands of powerful slave-holding majorities, a government that does have authority over how Boston does its business. Right? So the story that I'm going to tell today is, is, is part of this last third of the book. Uh, and it focuses on the way in which the, the, the rise of the textile mills transform not just economic life, although that is hugely important, but the entire orientation of Boston and New England within the larger United States as a whole, and how that change then drills down into Boston's own politics and culture in ways that are profoundly disturbing. So buckle your seat belts and put on your helmets because that's where we're going. Okay, so I've given you the big picture, the story of, of the book as a whole. Did I mention that these are nice, anyway. Um, so the rest of the story comes in four parts. And I need to f tell you, first of all, the story of how we get to the Lowell Mills, why it is that people like Francis Cabot Lowell came to do what he did here in Waltham and other parts of New England. Then the second part, we'll talk specifically about what happens here and how it changes the political economy of the region. And then the last two parts will, will take us into the, the politics that emerge once the, the mill system, its transformation of New England's economy and its connections to the American South are in place. So, oddly enough, the place we need to begin is by thinking about the American Revolutionary War and what it did to the city of Boston and its economy, and the way that the recovery of that took, uh, took place. And you see that word France in there. Maybe you weren't expecting to see that, but I'm going to argue for you that France was central to this transformation. So as you probably know, Boston lay under siege 
by the British, uh, well, occupied by the British army and besieged essentially by its own people and by its supporters from the New England countryside from the 19th of April of 75 to the 17th of March, 76. St. Patrick's Day, of course, very convenient that the British evacuated on that day. They, the city had already been occupied by British troops for about seven years before the fighting broke out. But that particular, you know, 10-month, 11-month period between Lexington and Concord and the British evacuation was unbelievably destructive for the city itself. It was destructive physically. That is, hemmed in by the siege, the British army and the uh, surviving residents tore down buildings to use for firewood, uh, were eating the bark off of trees and rats in order to survive because food was uh, prohibited from getting in there. There was a horrific smallpox epidemic that wiped out a lot of the population. And then finally, on the 17th of March, when uh, the army and navy evacuate the city, hundreds, actually more than hundreds, thousands of loyalists in the city left with them some to England, some to places like Nova Scotia or eventually Canada. But among those departing loyalists were many of the figures who had been leading merchants in Boston's economy through the course of the 18th century. And so not only was the city in ruins, its population of 16,000 reduced to maybe two or 3,000 by the time that the army left, but the lifeblood of its economy Right, which had been built through this overseas trading system for decade upon decade, had now lost many, many of its leaders. There were still some people on the Patriot side, like the Hancocks, uh, who remained in Boston. But a dramatic period of recovery takes place over the couple of decades after uh, uh, the devastation of Boston by the siege. Now, the initial plan and the successful plan was essentially to, be, to rebuild Boston's economy on the old model, right? And so what happens is many smaller scale merchant families from all over the New England region, like the Lowells and the Cabots and the Higginsons and many others coming from New Hampshire or the North Shore and all, saw this as an opportunity, moved to Boston and tried to, in a sense, fill the shoes of these older merchant families who had left. Some of the slack was taken up by people in Boston who had not been you know, at the highest levels of the merchant class, but now, too, saw this as an opportunity. And so I want to talk about a couple of examples of this. But you need to know that the outcome of the Revolutionary War and the treaty that settles it and the uh, orders that the British government sends out after the peace was that now its colonies were no longer, or its former colonies, the United States, were no longer allowed to trade in British colonies like Jamaica and Barbados and Antigua and all of these places that had been the bread and butter for Boston's merchants. This is where France comes in. Starting in 1778, the year that um, France signs the treaty with, to support the United States in the Revolutionary War, immediately French military forces start coming to North America again to join uh, the war effort. And from 1778 onwards, Boston becomes the principal harbor where the French Navy uh, is, uh, is stationed for the duration of the war. Um, a, a kind of hurricane or, or severe storm had badly damaged the French fleet off Rhode Island and they sort of limp into Boston Harbor. This was a, a, a sketch done by an officer of the French fleet showing the, the French ships in the harbors for, for repairs very early in the war. These contacts with the French Navy in particular were the essential starting point for that recovery effort. So Boston merchants, for instance, I, I talk about in the book, a man by the name of Samuel Breck, who had fled from the city during the siege, now comes back, uh, gets the contract with the French Navy to supply the Navy with all kinds of things, food and clothing and naval stores for repairing the ships and that sort of thing. And so you, they, you start to get the first commercial connections between Boston and the French after two centuries in which Bostonians had thought that Frenchmen, 
were the devil, you know, the, and France was the great opponent of, of the British Empire through all the colonial period, through all the wars with, uh, with New France or, or Canada and the like. Now, and especially once the war ends and Britain closes off the old trade routes to, to the former uh, West Indian colonies, now France is the land of opportunity. So Samuel Breck uh, was one of the first people to take this up. He actually sends his son to school in France, at a, of all things, and these were you know, uh, New England Puritan Congregationalists, to a French Jesuit college in the south of France for his education. It's like a decade before people would have been utterly appalled and, and unable to process such an idea. But, but it, it's a sense of what's changing about the culture. And another group, let's see if I got this right here, who, who follow up on this is the family uh, of Perkins. Uh, this is Thomas Handyside Perkins. If any of you uh, have ever been to the Boston Athenaeum uh, at the foot of the State House on Beacon Street, there's, this portrait is there. It's enormous. It's like a life-size portrait of, of, of T.H. Perkins at the height of his powers as one of the richest men in Boston. Well, he and his brothers were too young to be in the Revolutionary War, but they start to reach maturity, 1920, uh, in the early 1780s. And his older brother, James, has the idea that, okay, we can't go to Jamaica or, or, or Barbados. How about if we try Saint-Domingue? How about if it's today Haiti, right? The largest, the richest French colony, the colony that in the 18th century was responsible for importing a third of all of the enslaved Africans that came to the New World. Right? Haiti is booming. People are making fortunes in the sugar business there. And so first the oldest brother, then Thomas, and then not long after the third brother, Samuel, set up a trading house in Cap Francais, in, in the, the sort of northern capital city of Haiti. And between the middle of the 1780s and the early 1790s, they are making money hand over fist as uh, commercial agents buying and selling on behalf of the planters of Haiti. M much of what they're buying are enslaved Africans, but they're also dealing in any and everything, including all of those traditional products from, from the New England countryside that the, now the Haitian or the Saint-Domingue planters need to feed and clothe their slaves. So it's the same process, but now transferred to a French island. From there, this man, uh, who needs a new biography, by the way, if there are any expiring historians out there, this man goes on to open the China trade. The, the money they made in Saint-Domingue are what financed their ability to go to China and make an even larger for, fortune trading there at Wampoa. And then after he does that, and even after the French Revolution has started, he goes to France and makes all kinds of deals with the French government and with French merchants to sell American products to the French during the revolution because of course the French armies that are fighting these ever larger wars need more and more supplies, especially American grains. If, it, if it's something that you can ship overseas, uh, the Perkins family will do it and so they invest in that business as well. So you see what I'm saying, the part of the process of rebuilding Boston's economy was the same but different, right? The same way of operating, but now in this topsy-turvy post-revolutionary world, going to places like France that had been off limits before, but that are now uh, uh, possible for this new system. Let's see where we are now. Now the problem here that the Perkinses face, and by the way, Francis Cabot Lowell's career was very similar to this. He spends time in various trading houses in Boston. He does a little bit of work in the West Indies. He too goes to France in 1794 and 95 in the midst of the revolution and finds it really quite a lovely place to be and that there's a lot of money to be made there. So the, 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 the Cabot family is following, or the Lowell family, sorry, is, is following this model as well. Now, if the Perkinses went into the China trade, when Lowell came back, he and some of his trading partners, and as you can guess by a name like Francis Cabot Lowell, there was a tremendous amount of intermarriage among these merchant families, right? Um, they thought perhaps India was the place where they could make inroads. And so late in the 1790s, early in the next century, uh, Francis Cabot Lowell develops what is still known as India Wharf. 
on Boston Harbor, right? Again, designed to be a place that's going to specialize in breaking into the, the, the trade in the Indian Ocean, right? So it, this is more complicated and difficult because of course India is a British colony and there's, there's a greater deal of competition over that. But what I'm sort of bringing us towards here by talking about both the British and the French is the fact that uh, the elephant in the room here is France and the French Revolution and what it does to not only European politics and warfare, but really the, the, the global trading system. The French Revolution begins in 1789 or so. By 1793, Britain and France and Britain's other European allies who are increasingly fearful of this revolutionary movement that has now uh, convicted and executed the king, uh, go to war with France. And so from 1793 onward, with very little uh, break of any kind in it, until 1815, so that's what, 22 years, Britain and France are engaged in war, not just on the European continent, but all over the world. And one of their principal concerns is their ability to dominate global trade, partly because in different ways and for different reasons, both of them needed supplies from overseas places to make up for things that they didn't have at home or in their home countries. And so the challenge of Boston, really of all Americans engaged in this kind of overseas mercantile activity, is the way in which this profound conflict between Britain and France is uh, throwing a monkey wrench into the entire world of overseas trade. And this political conflict will feed into the desire for uh, the building of the industrial complex here in New England. So let me shift now to talk about what happens in the United States in the first decade of the 19th century under the presidency of Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson and the party that he founded, the Democratic Republicans or the Republicans, they called themselves various things, were profound believers in land, in geographical expansion, in an ag agricultural society, and extraordinarily suspicious of overseas trade and of the kinds of results that trading economies produced, especially the rise of urban centers and manufacturing and the like. Therefore, they were on the whole inveterately hostile to Boston and the kind of economy that Boston pursued. As plantation owners, they had generally, and their ancestors before them, always expected that merchants from somewhere else would come in, buy their tobacco, sell them what they needed, and be on their way. But they didn't see a great deal of value, of productivity, in what merchants did. And that attitude profoundly affected the way in which the Jefferson administration responded to the intensifying wars between Britain and France, especially once Napoleon Bonaparte becomes emperor. Bonaparte institutes what he referred to as the continental system. That is a kind of barricade or embargo out of all of Europe that he had conquered, insisting that if you were France's ally, you could trade with them. But if you traded with Britain, you were not allowed. You had no access to the markets of Europe. He made it into this sort of us or them kind of thing. And in its orders and council, once Napoleon created the continental system, Britain essentially made the same claim. That if you trade with France, then you can't trade with us or any part of the world that Britain controls. And this left the merchants of the United States in something of a quandary, right? The road to success that people like the, the Lowell's and the Perkinses had taken by going other places that Britain was allowing was now uh, dangerous, right? Part of the problem was that although France was a nice, interesting new market, Britain had always been the overwhelmingly biggest trading partner of Boston for sure, but of the United States generally. So 
Jefferson, in opposition to the policies of both countries, tried to pry them open with a peculiar tactic by essentially casting a pox on both their houses and declaring, with Congress's support in 1807, a complete and utter embargo of all American trade with anywhere else in the rest of the world. Yes, I hear rumbling here. And this went on for nearly two years, right? With some exceptions, because for instance, they made exceptions for not American merchants, but foreign merchants to come into Virginia and buy Virginia's tobacco and take it out. So actually, Virginia didn't suffer all that much from the embargo, but it was ruinous for Boston, right? For a city that for now, really close to 200 years, had built its entire livelihood around its capacity to trade wherever it wanted to in the world, and that had fought a revolution in Britain prompted in no small part by Britain's unwillingness to let Bostonians trade wherever they wanted to. For the United States government to be doing this was anathema, but they could do nothing about it because they were now under a government that had the power over them to enforce this embargo. And for two years, the ships rotted at the docks and the economy of Boston and New England tanked. People suffered badly from this. It was in the aftermath of that and with the ongoing prospect for war with Britain that Jefferson's successor, James Madison, was talking up through the early years of his administration that Francis Cabot Lowell had an idea. He went on a tour of Britain and visited the new industrial textile mills in places like Glasgow and Manchester in Birmingham. And the story anyway, I don't know how this could ever be verified, but the story was that he had a prodigious intellect and visual memory. And this was important because in fear of industrial espionage, the British government absolutely prohibited anyone to write things down, to draw plans, to bring this information out of the country. They searched baggage of people, you know, non-British nationals departing from England. They prevented British working men who had skill and knowledge in these things from emigrating anywhere. In fact, the man, Samuel Slater, who started the cotton spinning mill in Rhode Island, had to leave England in disguise in order to get to America to take up this economic opportunity, right? This was, this was high opposition to uh, thefts of, of uh, Britain's intellectual property, an issue that still plagues our world today, right? Lowell pulled this off. He committed to memory how these fantastically complex systems worked, came back here, employed a brilliant mechanical engineer by the name of Paul Moody to work with him, and on this spot in 1815 developed the Boston Manufacturing Company that even exceeded what they were doing in Manchester and Glasgow. That is, they brought every bit of the process from the raw wool to the finished co uh, cotton into mechanization here at Waltham. Here because it was powered by the falls on the Charles River. The water was the power that, that moved the machines at the time. It, it was an extraordinary act of industrial espionage. And it changed the structure of Boston's economy in a profound way, but not all by itself, right? The technology, the, the whether you want to call it innovation or theft, I don't know, uh, but, but uh, that alone was not enough to transform things. A couple of other things that are, that are necessary to this story. What it took to build this was capital investment on a much larger scale than anything that had ever been done in this country before. And so the argument that Lowell makes among that closely interconnected network of kin and marriage and that sort of thing, merchants who'd made fortunes in previous centuries and, and, and were quite prosperous men, was that this was the recipe to deal with the problem of Jefferson. The problem of a national administration that, you know, with a stroke of a pen could destroy Boston's economy. Merchants always worried about investment, right? You put your goods on a ship and the ship sinks, trouble. That's why insurance was invented. 
This, Lowell argued, was the way to deal with that problem. And it needed a kind of institutional or formal structure to do that. And so he, and a number of the people that he worked with at the time, started using the form of the chartered corporation as a way to amass capital among usually a smallish group of investors. These weren't public corporations that were thrown open to anybody. These would be a dozen or so of their friends, colleagues, family connections who would invest their capital, but at a scale and with a control over the corporate system and with the privileges that went with it, like limited liability and the like, that could make larger enterprises than any that had been known before. So when the Boston Manufacturing Company was capitalized here, it was initially capitalized at $400,000. This is 1815, right? 10 times bigger than any other American company at the time. Right? And it only gets bigger from that as they move to Lowell and Lawrence and, and get more and more capital going and this sort of thing. So that's a big part of the story. But even that's not enough. And I have to say a few technical things about cotton and tariffs. So this is the part to take a nap now if you want to. But uh, it's actually really important. So the biggest cotton textile producer in the world is England. That's the competition. As soon as the War of 1812 ended, which closed off trade yet again between you know, uh, England and America and was ruinous for Boston's economy and made uh, people like Lowell all the more willing to do this. The first thing that England did was dump tons and tons of cotton textiles on the American market really cheap. They knew that during the war, a number of companies had tried to start making their own cotton and they wanted to just kill that. Right? They wanted a, effectively a national monopoly on this kind of cotton production. Lowell had the kind of capital to be able to survive that initial dumping that Britain does. But he knew there was a long-term problem here. The problem was a lot of the cotton that England was selling in America came actually from India. It was very cheap cotton low quality, produced in a very uh, unmechanized way, but using labor that was so cheap that they sold it at very low prices in America. The other kind of cotton that was popular in America was Britain, Britain's textiles coming out of their factories that was very high quality, expensive, but really quite good cotton. In fact, a lot of what they used to make that cotton came from the Carolinas and Georgia, the Sea Islands, where they made this fine, long staple cotton that was very good for the finest quality cotton. Now, as the Boston Manufacturing Company got going, Lowell figured out that the price at which they could sell the cotton they were making and still make a profit was about 25 cents a yard as it's rolling off the machines. But the Indian cotton that was coming in was selling for much, much cheaper than that. The British cotton that was coming in, a lot of it was much more expensive than that, but it was much better than anything that the Lowell Mills could make. So Francis Cabot Lowell hatched a plan. He went to Washington not as a member of Congress, not as an official representative of Boston or New England, but as a lobbyist at a time when lobbying was still not really a well-developed art. And what he did was to meet up with two members of Congress, not from his own region, but from South Carolina. Do I have them here? Oh, I'm gonna skip past this. Uh, Oh, here, here's our guy. There's no portrait of, of Lowell. Uh, all we have is this silhouette, but that was uh, Paul Moody, his, his engineer. Uh, he went and met these guys. John C. Calhoun, young congressman from Carolina, and his colleague, William Lowndes, also a young congressman from Carolina. Now, why is Lowell going to Carolina's congressman for help and not his own? The answer is that he wants a tariff. What he wants, and he's trying to thread the needle here, he would like a tariff that's high enough so that it keeps out that cheap cotton from India, right? Make that cotton more expensive than the cotton that he's making. But not so high 
that it will keep out the high quality cotton coming from England. Why does he care about that? Well, it's obvious why he cares about the India part. But these guys represent a region that's producing the high quality cotton that the London merchants buy and then ship to America after it's been processed, right? So by keeping the tariff low enough, these guys will still be able to sell their cotton to England. If it went too high so that England's became prohibitive, then the English merchants wouldn't buy cotton from Carolina. They'd get it somewhere else, right? This is very appealing to Calhoun and Lowndes. He's not doing this in New England because in New England, which is still dominated by merchants, right? This industry is just totally brand new. And by an economy that's traditionally been built on overseas trade, New Englanders hate tariffs. They've always hated tariffs. That's another word for the customs duties that Britain was enforcing in the 1760s and 70s. They want free trade. They think that's what's best for them. They've hated the past you know, 20 years of war that's thrown up all these barriers. They want free trade. So the last thing New England congressmen are going to do is vote for tariffs. And so that's why he goes to them. And so Lowndes, who was the head of the Ways and Means Committee at the time, pushes this bill through Congress. And it wins an easy majority with zero votes from New England. Right? So you see what Lowell is doing. He's engaging in a weirdly kind of, not just unrepresentative, but anti-representative politics for, based on his vision of where his region is going, even though nobody there supports it. Did I say nobody? Actually, there's one guy who supports it. That guy. That's Daniel Webster, right? A brilliant portrait of him capturing the sort of dark intensity that he was known for. I'll, I'll talk about him a bit more in a minute. But to do that, I have to sort of cycle back and tell a bit more of the politics of this story. So I mentioned already the, the, the hostility, the enmity between the Jefferson administration, the Virginia dynasty in general, and New England and its economic interests. It could be quite fierce. At the heart of that enmity, in a structural way, was the infamous three-fifths clause. I'm, I'm guessing, yes, all of you probably know what this is. Yes, can I, anyway. It was the clause built into the Constitution, the compromise that made it possible for the Carolina, Carolinas, above all, to think about uh, ratifying the Constitution, meant to deal with the, the problem of enslaved people, right? And it uh, posited that for purposes of both representation and direct taxation, that enslaved people would, for every five, count as the equivalent of three free people in enumerating the number of representatives each state got in Congress, and if the federal government ever taxed the states directly, the proportion that each state would have to pay. Okay. Does anyone know how many times the United States ever laid such a direct tax that required the proportionate payment based on that three-fifths clause? Never is exactly right. Zero times, right? So that side of it was never enacted. And it was never enacted precisely because of the other side of it. Because that three-fifths bonus and representation in the body that lays the taxes meant that the Southerners always had a majority to prevent even the idea that you would tax that way, right? So the kind of taxes that the United States laid throughout the 19th century was always tariffs, always customs duties. That's how it raised its, its taxation money, okay? And quite quickly, New Englanders became acutely aware of this problem. Already in Jefferson's administration, they begin talking about the options that they have. One option is secession. And there are any number of times in that first decade, right through 1815, where powerful, important figures and senators, congressmen, and the like are, are considering this seriously. 
Another possibility is some version of a kind of state's rights theory, that the state can interpose its will against federal legislation that it thinks it's wrong. That kind of, that political idea was invented in New England because of various uh, issues with respect to the, the Jefferson and the Madison administration. So in fact, I think I'm gonna give you one example of this to, to show how stark this was. There's a little asterisk, there's a technicality to that never answer about did the United States ever tax that way? It's this, during the War of 1812, which was going really badly for the United States, Washington sacked and burned, the White House in flames, etc. Madison's administration insists that the states should call up their militias to fight for the United States in this war. And many of the states, including the New England states, said, well, that's kind of a tax, isn't it? Requiring every state to contribute to this war effort. So it ought to be done according to the direct tax uh, clause of the Constitution, whereas every state does, you know, its population plus three-fifths of enslaved people, which, you know, in New England by this time is essentially none. Well, the southern states were not going to do that for two reasons. Neither would they arm their own slaves to train them in the arts of war. This is in the aftermath of the Haitian Revolution, of course. But because so much of their labor was done by enslaved people, two-thirds of the population of South Carolina, they're not going to force an extra surplus of their free white young men to go into arms and fight in a distant war and leave the state in the hands of the enslaved people, right? So they never even consider doing that, right? But New Englanders, I think, rightly argue that this is an utter violation of the Constitution, right? And it's, and it's driven by the three-fifths clause, right? It's driven by the extra power that the southern states have. Boston's congressman, Josiah Quincy, in a famous speech in Congress, calculates that the three-fifths clause gives the states that have large slave populations 22 extra representatives in Congress. And how many representatives did the state of Massachusetts have? 22. Right? In other words, the, 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 the slave states' power over the way the House of Representatives worked was, was so dominant here that New England's political representatives really were turning to other options. And the, the last of them was the famous Hartford Convention of 1814, when although secession was considered, instead they came up with a list of amendments that they were going to insist that Congress begin pushing through, including first and foremost ending the three-fifths clause and readjusting how representation worked in the United States. Now that failed because of the immense coincidence of the end of the war just at the time that they arrived with these amendments, the Treaty of Ghent and the victory of uh, Andrew Jackson at the Battle of New Orleans. And so they were, they were humiliated in this effort. They were treated as traitors, but it shows the degree to which this politics riled the two sections. Now, growing up in New England, he was a huge supporter of Boston's political positions right through the Jefferson administration, right through the War of 1812. He becomes a congressman from New Hampshire, from Portsmouth. And while he is uh, in Congress, he, he fiercely opposes that, uh, in, that uh, legislation attempting to call up the militia for exactly those purposes, saying that the states should have the right to interpose their will against a clearly unconstitutional federal law. He's a sharp critic of Jefferson. And he is an important critic of slavery. He moves to Boston in, after the War of 1812 and becomes a congressman from Boston early in the 1820s. In 1820, on the bicentennial of the uh, Pilgrims landing at Plymouth, he gives a famous, famous speech commemorating that event. And in the end, he turns it to a critique of the ongoing slave trade, both illegally overseas, but 
in the United States itself, and, and sort of calling out imagery of the way in which the, 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 the lash and the chain are still you know, haunting the, the United States at the time. Now, the one thing that Daniel Webster did not have was money. He grew up way up in New Hampshire near the uh, headwaters of the Merrimack River. Early in life, he married the daughter of a local preacher, not an immense source of wealth, but he was ambitious, and New Hampshire wasn't big enough for him, and he moves to Boston and becomes a lawyer and is an extremely successful lawyer with a flourishing practice. So he buys a house on Beacon Hill and he wants to live the kind of grand life that many of the other talented young Bostonians at the time were living. Edward Everett, George Tickner, the rising politicians of this period. But without their money, he's got trouble. They some of them, like Edward Everett, for instance, who grew up in Boston, went to Harvard, was part of this culture, could pursue their political and their literary careers partly because they married into the great wealth of the merchants and the rising industrial class. That's what Everett did. Webster didn't have that possibility. But as a profound lawyer, he could start to work for these people. So while he was in Congress for New Hampshire in 1816, he met Francis Cabot Lowell on Lowell's lobbying trip to Washington and worked with Lowell to draft that tariff bill that then the South Carolinians could push through. I said there were no New England votes in favor of that tariff bill. It's because Webster absented himself from that vote. He, uh, he had something else he had to do that day, right? He did not want to have to vote for the bill that he wrote uh, in front of... Portsmouth, of course, of all things, was still a major trading city. But already at that point, and then over the course of the next years, he becomes more and more the lawyer for the Boston Associates, for the, the consortiums building the mills, and after the mills, the railroads and the like. So now I can round out this story. The mills themselves were just fantastically profitable. In fact, I begin the chapter on this with a quotation from Nathan Appleton, who was one of the partners with, uh, with Lowell. Years later, thinking back, talking about how in those very first years, Lowell, who was a careful bookkeeper, was just going over and over the records. And he finally says to Appleton something along the lines of, I can't find anything wrong with my calculations, except that it's just more profitable than I can possibly believe, right? That, that the, the amount that the mills in the early years were turning out were fantastic. Dividends from like 15 to 25 percent to investors every year in those first 10, 15 years of the mills. But that was only part of the story, right? Because the mills themselves then generate lots more economic development. Even before the mills, they had built this canal, the Middlesex Canal, from the Merrimack down to the Charles. But shortly afterwards, as railroad technology begins to come online, the mills start spurring that. So the Boston and Lowell Railroad is one of the first uh, railroads built, and people like Thomas Perkins are, are huge investors in that. And it transforms not just here in Waltham and Lowell and Merrimack uh, and, and Lawrence up in the Merrimack, but in the city itself. Because as all this cotton is pouring into the wharves, it generates all kinds of other interest in industries like clothing processing, the making of cheap clothes. Where is, these, where is this cheap clothing going, by the way? A lot of it back to the south to clothe the slaves who grew the cotton. Um, uh, it, it helps the growth of the footwear industry, boots and shoes, uh, banks, insurance companies, shops, tradings. More and more of Boston's economy is deeply tied to the mill's expansion. 1837 is the year that Massachusetts conducts its first industrial survey of the state. And a huge percentage of Boston's economy by that time is now clearly tied to the cotton industry and what has been generated here at, at Lowell. And that's exactly the problem because if you think back to the old days, right, the pre-industrial economy, going all the way back to the 17th century, 
the things that Boston merchants sold out into the Atlantic in the West Indies and the like were things that New England farmers had made, had grown, had produced, the timber, the animals, the food, etc. Now, in this system, the economy is booming, but it's entirely dependent on a commodity, cotton, that you can't make in New England. And so the politics of all of this has changed. Now, neither Francis Cabot Lowell nor John C. Calhoun could have imagined this in 1816. But in only 20, 25 years, the world has changed so much that now the Boston associates, these merchant leaders of New England's economy, and thousands of the workers of Boston and the merchants and the shopkeepers and the like are, whether they know it, whether they're conscious of it, whether they like it or not, they're profound supporters of the cotton kingdom, of the, 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 the kind of industrial agriculture that has made the southern part of the United States the most, even more dynamic of an economic center than New England was at the time. That transformation itself is, is immense. And so this is the problem. Because once Webster becomes the lawyer of these people, his politics start to change. His anti-slavery positions, his belief in things like the rights of states to interpose themselves against laws of the federal government, all this now starts to change. Famously, in the early 1830s, when South Carolina tries to nullify a tariff, Webster argues, oh, no, 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 a tariff, that's a federal law. It takes precedence over any state's ability to interpose against it. And yet, at the same time, when the abolitionist movement begins to arise in places like Boston in the 1830s, attacking the institution of slavery, Webster, as the lawyer of the Lords of the Loom, says, actually, that's a state issue. We should leave each state alone to decide things like slavery or not. He's for the Constitution the way it is. He's not for amending the three-fifths clause, even though he had been a big supporter of that back in 1814 at the time of the Hartford Convention. So you see what I'm saying? What, what happens with this dramatic transformation of New England's economy is that it reorients entirely the way that the city and the surrounding countryside are situated in the United States as a whole. And the, the book concludes by tracing that story to its end. And you'll have to buy the book and read it if you want to. No, 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 no. I, I'll, I'll give you a hint, OK, to, to conclude. I'll give you a hint. Essentially, Webster has sold his soul to the money devil, right? He, for, for the sake of the money and the power that comes with it, he has given up his principles, and he is willing to argue both sides of a question if it will keep the union intact in a way that will make the mills keep running. He might have been able to withstand that kind of internal tension. But the last part of the book talks about the way in which the city and the region itself suffered badly and was torn apart by those tensions. Because both sides of this equation grow and develop in the 1830s and 40s and 50s. That is, the opposition to slavery coming above all, and importantly, and this too often gets overlooked, from escaped slaves and free blacks in Boston and in other places in, in New England and the Northeast, the David Walkers and Frederick Douglasses and the like, arguing uh, uh, against this heinous system and developing a, an effective politics to attack it on the one hand. And on the other hand, the simply undeniable fact that uh, it's not just a southern institution, it's not just a southern problem, that, that to its depths the economy of, of Boston and the surrounding countryside are, are profoundly connected to this system and many of its uh, intellectual, political, and economic leaders are, are willing to sustain that devotion against um, the challenges of anti-slavery people. So Boston becomes a scene of incredible tension and violence during those years. The, the mobbing of abolitionists, attacks of one racial group upon another. 
And even after the election of Abraham Lincoln, even after South Carolina and other uh, southern states have started to secede from the Union and build their own confederacy, an anti-slavery figure like Wendell Phillips has to be accompanied around Boston by an armed guard, dozens of men, when he gives an anti-slavery speech so that the pro-slavery people in Boston will not lynch him, right? The, the intensity of that divide that in, in some ways Webster's career represents plays itself out in the city's history over the next several decades, and that, that's how the book finishes. So I'll finish there now, too, and I'm happy to answer any questions, and I'm sure I skipped over all kinds of things, but I appreciate your coming out on this cold night and, and listening to my story of the transformation of the political economy that the textile mills generated. Thanks. Thank you.